Moving on in our series from the Spartans and the Athenians to Alexander the Great. Um, Alexander's tutor when he was a boy was Aristotle. Alexander's father, Philip of Macedon, brought the great philosopher to Macedonia to tutor Alexander and his other boyhood princes. So we know that Alexander had a thorough grounding in concepts of ethics and morals and philosophy. But, 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 Alexander, on the other hand, he burned the great city of Thebes to the ground, massacred its population. Throughout his conquests, he, you know, massacred, depopulated people, produced all kinds of mayhem and havoc out there. So um, today I want to talk about when, about the limitations of the warrior archetype. This, uh, when it's the idea of conquest itself. When we originally were talking about the Spartans as the ideal version of the warrior ethos, we were talking about a defensive stand at the Battle of Thermopylae against overwhelming odds. So it was kind of as, as honorable as something would get. But with Alexander, now we enter with the concept of conquest, where what he was doing was aggressive and was really about taking warfare and subjugation to places that had never even heard of him. And so we're now getting into the point where a real moral dimension enters, enters the, uh, the concept of the warrior archetype. When does aggression that can be good in certain aspects of our life, overcoming obstacles, become a straight ahead conquest and oppression and subjugation? And all of this kind of came to a head for Alexander in India when he confronted this king, this great king, Porus, P-O-R-U-S. And when they said, they talked about Porus, they said that he was so big that talking to him was like talking to a man on horseback. And Alexander came to the river that he was going to have to cross to invade Porus's kingdom. And the two of them met on a barge in the middle of the river. And Porus knew that Alexander's army was marshalling there and was ready to cross. And so he came out and he greeted Alexander and he said, in the, in the most kind way, and he said, I will make you as I welcome you. I will make you the heir to my throne. I will marry you to my daughter. And I will, I will uh, greet you, or treat you with respect and everything. And he said, he said to Alexander, stay with me. I will teach you to be a king. And at that point, Alexander's face like grew dark with fury, they say, because he thought to himself, I am a king. Who is more of a king than I am? I've just conquered the whole Persian empire. And so Porus, still in kind of in, in goodwill, he said to Alexander, no, no, no. He said, you are not a king. You are a conqueror. And he said, let me explain the difference between a king and a conqueror to you. He said, you have conquered all the lands. You've conquered Persia. You've conquered Babylonia. You've conquered Medea. You've conquered Egypt, all these lands. But what have you done for the people in those lands? He said, all you do is you turn over you turn over these lands to the same princes that oppressed the people before you were there, and you, while you move on, taking all the tribute. And he said that you're really, your army is just like a fleet at sea that controls only this part of the ocean that they're on, and everything else is just in the wake, left alone. He said, what have you done for the people that you rule? Are they any better? Are they any freer? Are they any more prosperous? And he said, instead, I want you to look at my land here, my kingdom. And he pointed to the other side of the river. And he said, here I rule with justice and wisdom. The land flourishes. The people are free. Everybody is happy. Even the animals are happy over here. And so that is the difference between a king and a conqueror. And he said, and then Porus kind of got to the real meat of the issue. And he said to Alexander, by what law of heaven do you dare to come and attack my kingdom? We have never even heard of you. We treat, we're, I'm here greeting you with respect. What are you going to do with my people? Are you going to kill the men? Are you going to rape the women? Are you going to take everything that was good that we've worked for for our whole lives? He said, you are not a king. You are a conqueror. And so now we're really getting, what's really interesting to me about this exchange is, again, it's a clash of archetypes. It's the warrior on warrior conqueror in Alexander and the king in Porus. And we can see that the king is definitely the superior moral moral uh, character in this thing. So what we're also talking about here is the limitations of the warrior archetype.
If we think about the virtues that we've talked about of, of war, of obedience, of fidelity, of patience, of courage, of, uh, of aggressiveness, of the willing embracing of adversity, these can be applied to the dark side just as well as to the light side. If you think about Hitler's Gestapo and the SS, there's no doubt in my mind that in their training and their inculcation of their men and officers, they cited the Spartan type virtues, the warrior virtues of courage and fidelity and obedience and patience and so forth. If we think about Stalin's secret police, it was the same thing. And let's not let ourselves off the hook either. We Americans have gone over to the dark side many occasions. So what's missing here in the warrior archetype by itself is a, is a dimension of moral, of moral restraint, of inclusion, of empathy, of compassion for the other, and of, and of commitment to a higher level of morality and ethics. So again, when Alexander reached this point in India, it really became clear to him that the warrior archetype was missing a dimension. And he went on, Alexander did, to try to address this. And he had tried to address it in the past. So in our next episodes, we're gonna get into that, what, how Alexander brought this to a head in his, in his own mind and what he did about it.